Hey everybody, welcome back to CAF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babbitt, co-founder of Challenge Athletes Foundation. Every week we get to meet some of the most amazing challenged athletes in the world. This week, it is my honor to welcome, she is a the first paralyzed woman to finish an Ironman, two-time Ironman world champ, two-time Ironman world championship qualifier. And she was at the 2016 Paralympics and is hopefully going back in 2021. Trisha Downing joins us. Trisha, how are you? I'm doing well, Bob. It's good to see you. I love the CAF shirt. It looks awesome. Thank you. It's from the Way Back collection, actually, I think. Yeah. yeah. So you were a sporty kid from early on. I was reading somewhere you're like four years old and mom threw you in the pool and you, you were, weren't quite ready for it. What, you, you puke all over the pool? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had this excellent gag reflex that I could summons at any time. So that I, I did that, that worked for a year, but um, when I was five, it was back to the water and that's where I was staying. And then you loved it. I did. I, did. I loved, loved swimming. That was my first competitive sport. And then from swimming, you move on into gymnastics. That was your next sport. Yeah. And swimming do gymnastics all through high school. Uh, yep. And then threw in a little bit of diving there. Yes, and then you're too tall in college for gymnastics, so that's where you get into <laughs> diving at University of Vermont. And I just love all the different stuff you're doing. So 95, grad school, sports management, internship at the OTC, assigned to USA Cycling Team, and that's what got you into cycling? That is, yes. I did an internship um, at the end of my grad school at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center, and um, just loved watching the cycling. And I'd, I'd been a cyclist um, as a commuter for my whole life. That's how I got to swim team practice. But I never really knew that it was a competitive sport. So that opened my eyes to something that was totally new. And at the same time, you became a, you were piloting for blind athletes, right? On your, on a tandem. Right. Yep. That was one of the things that my coach said would help my bike handling skills. If I was willing to jump on a tandem. He said, if you can pilot a tandem, you can do anything. So, so you, that's what I did. The 98 World Disabled Cycling Championships. And so you got it, you met a lot of wheelchair bound athletes. Right, yeah. And that, so then when you were, did you, were you at our San Diego Triathlon Challenge before you were injured? I was, I was there, I believe it was 99 was my first year. And then I was injured in 2000 and back in 2001. So when you were injured, because for a lot of people, there's that obviously depression and spiraling downward and not sure what to do. The fact that you'd been at SDT, the fact that you've been a pilot for blind athletes before, did that give you a sense of, hey, there's still sport out there? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of that helped my recovery because I had I had contact with athletes who were wheelchair users, you know, the blind athletes, uh, you know, you name it, there were all kinds of disabilities on that world championship team. And so I had the opportunity to see how everybody sort of operated in um, maybe a little bit different sphere than I was operating in at the time. So when I was injured, I knew that there were a lot of possibilities for me, which was awesome. Did you fill out your grant request while you were in the hospital? I did. I filled it out from my bed at the hospital. <laughs> that is amazing. So, I mean, I tell people all the time that Trisha Downing came back from that injury, and I think you were US, USA Triathlon Disabled Athlete of the Year, the uh, prepared triathlete of the year the following year, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was 2003. Okay. I started triathlons in 2002, and I think it was 2003. I mean, so you, once I jumped in, I just went full force ahead. All in because you're to 2000, you're injured, and by 2002, 2003, you're already competing. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. And you have done over 100 multi sport events and competed in, in so many triathlons, duathlons, all that type of stuff. What was it about that sport that, that you really enjoyed? Um, I really liked the um, just being able to push myself at my pace. I mean, with triathlon, you, you know, you start with people who are maybe not even in your age group, if they start a couple of age groups together or 
um, you know, everybody's got different body types and different speeds and different everything. So I felt like I could fit in there just being who I was as opposed to um, like when I was bike racing, it's sort of like you're either in the field or you're not, you know, like if you're right. not, if you're not in the pack, you're not in the race. So right. um, but triathlon, you can kind of like go at your own pace and I could, I could learn and I could, you know, get better at my own pace. And so it really, that's what really appealed to me. What's fascinating, triathlon became an Olympic sport in 2000, but it didn't become a Paralympic sport in 2016. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you're like, darn it, if that had come about like in 2008, I would have been all over that. Yes, that would have been perfect. And that was, you know, that's what we were going for, right? When we started the, the Paralympic um, development team, when CAF and USAT jumped in together and started that team. And I was, I was kind of one of the first members um, yes, on that group that went to that first um, New York City triathlon that we labeled our nationals. So, um, you know, I was there from the very beginning. That is so cool. What from, and you came back to you at, to San Diego Triathlon Challenge a number of years, correct? Yes. I mean, I've been there since 2001. I've probably, I've been there more years than I haven't. So, um, you know, I had to skip the year that there was the fire when it was canceled. And right. there've been a couple of other years I've had other events, but for the most part, I've been at just about every one since 2001. I mean, the hard part is with, without the Paralympic event, really the only option was Ironman, right? There is right. like, you had to go long. And even yeah. 70.3 really wasn't around much at that point. It was full Ironman. Did you feel yeah, that was, you were so big or that? go home? Yeah, you go big or um, go home. Would you feel yeah. you were better at the shorter? Um, no, I actually think I was better at the longer distance. Yeah. Um, because I can just kind of, I can ride all day long, um, you know, more than I can put the power behind like a sprint. So for me, it was the distance that was really, um, you know, what suited me best. So you, you qualify for Kona in 2006 to 2010, and people don't quite understand how the equipment has changed so much and how much lighter the hand cycles are now than they were back in 2006 and 2010. The, the hard part was always getting through that bike. You knew right. you were gonna get through to swim. You knew once, if you made the bike cutoff time, you would do the marathon. That wouldn't be a problem in your racing right. trip. Absolutely, yeah. How frustrating was that for you? Just because I think so much of it is equipment wasn't there yet because your hand cycles were so much heavier than they are now. I agree, they were heavy. They weren't very arrow, you know, you were sitting straight up. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that really was, that was hard on me because I knew I had the ability and I did finish um, two iron distance races that weren't um, Hawaii. And yeah. I was able to finish under the 17 hour cutoff time, but it was making that swim bike cutoff time. That was the challenge. Always a challenge, but you need pioneers. Yeah. You need people to push it, right? We had John Franks and John and uh, John McClain trying it before finally making the men's cutoff time. Yeah. How much has the acceptance uh, for for para athletes? How much has that changed since you've been involved with this since like 2001, 2002? Um, well, definitely. I mean, like overall in the whole mm -hmm. triathlon picture, I think that um, the not just acceptance but understanding and um, you know the presence of of the athletes. You know, I think that's changed a lot over the years. And, you know, when I used to go to triathlons in the beginning, you know, people would be looking at me and pointing like, oh my gosh, what is she doing? Like, what, what is this stuff? And how is she going to do this race in a wheelchair? And now when you show up at a triathlon, people don't even give you a second glance. They're like, oh, of course she's here. She's going to do the race in a chair, you know? <laughs> so it, it really has changed a lot. And I, you know, it, it was fun in the beginning just because, you know, we were doing things so differently and, yeah. you know, we'd show up a team of wheelchairs and amputees and, you know, had, get all these stairs and, and so much, you know, cheering out on the course. And I, I think all of that is still there, but, you know, people are more used to seeing it and, and it's just normal now. It's funny because we think of triathlon is equipment intensive. And I remember David Bailey, uh, Ironman World Champion in the Hand Cycle Division in 2000, telling me, he says, yeah, you, you guys have it easy. We need a Sherpa because we right. need our everyday chair. We need our hand cycle. We need our racing chair. We need our, our, our spare wheels. 
you know, you, you trying to get through an airport with all this stuff is a freaking nightmare. Did you get to travel much overseas in, in race triathlons? I did. I've traveled to New Zealand. I've traveled to Australia. Um, we went to the London paratriathlon a couple of times. And so, um, you know, I'm very familiar with the pain that it is to travel as a wheelchair triathlete. And um, to be honest, that was one of the things that wore on me the most. Um, you know, it wasn't the racing itself. It was just getting to the race and having everything with you and, you know, the logistics and having to, you know, pay for another person to come along with you. I mean, it got expensive. It was cumbersome. Um, yeah. You know, those were kind of the drawbacks of the sport, but I, I, I just love doing triathlon. So, you know, for so many years, I just pushed on anyway. So you move into rowing, 2011, competed as part of the U.S. rowing team at the Worlds. And then when did shooting come into your life? Because when you think about this sport, talk about, a, you don't have a lot of equipment to deal with, right? When, you, when you're shooting. No, no, although there is still a fair amount. Um, just because, you know, it adds up the more events you do and the more, um, you know, you still have to have some adaptations and, and things that you bring with you. But um, the, my short stint in rowing um, really did a number on my body and mm. um, I had four surgeries after, yeah. after that time and, um, you know, had chronic pain and I thought my athletic career was going to be over. And so for several years, I did absolutely nothing. Um, and then I just decided one day I have to be an athlete again. And I pulled out the list of Paralympic sports and I thought, what's, what's not going to kill my body. And, you know, not knowing anything about shooting, I just decided that was the sport. And, um, I called up the national team coach and I said, you know, what does it take to be a good, you know, shooting sports athlete? And he's like, well, we can teach you to do it. You just have to have the dedication to do the training because a lot of it is, you know, repetitive and boring and, um, you know, just time intensive. And I was like, well, I, I've been on a, you know, hand cycle for 10 hours at a time. You know, you don't have to tell me about time intensive. So I started shooting. And not just started shooting, you end up going to Rio and make, like, I, I know early on, it would have been great to go to triathlon, uh, paratriathlon, but all of a sudden you're, you become a Paralympian in Rio. How was that experience? Uh, the experience was awesome. I mean, it was just, it was really cool to be at an event that large and to be representing the United States and, um, and just to see what a big difference it was from you know, those first days when we went to the New York City Triathlon yep. and we were staying in the YMCA and we got two t-shirts and um, a jersey, you know, and then, it, you know, at the Paralympics, you're getting, you know, treated like kings and queens and you get more apparel than you can fit into a bag and, you know, you meet other athletes from other countries. I mean, it was just like, we just, you know, I, I've gotten to see so much in my athletic career, so much um, just forward movement and progress in, in the para, um, you know, athlete community that it just, it, it's pretty cool to see how things have changed. Well, and if we have a Paralympics for 2021, that is a goal for you, right? Absolutely. Yep. I'm still training and, um, you know, it is harder to stay motivated, but at the same time, you know, you can't just stop because we, you know, we don't know. It, it could be yes, it could be no. Um, yeah. But if it's yes, I want to be prepared. So I'm still training just like I would normally and um, keeping my fingers crossed. Is there a, like, a Paralympic trials that you guys go to? Because I know for swimming, cycling and um, running track and field, it's in Minnesota in June. You guys have a trials you go to? Right. So, yeah, we've had um, several events where you can earn a quota. Mm -hmm. um, which means you earn a spot for the United States. And then, um, then you technically will probably get that quota to go to the games. Um, but so uh, we have one more quota event and I will be trying to win a quota there. Um, hopefully that will take place in May in Lima, Peru. But, you know, it's all, it's all up to COVID and, you know, how things shake out with that. Are there different, I don't know much about, uh, about pistol shooting. What, what are the events and do you compete in multiple events and how far are the targets? I do, I compete in the 10 meter air pistol. 
and I compete in the 25 meter uh, sport pistol and that's a 22 pistol. Okay. And then um, I've started competing at the 50 meter um, length also, and that's also a 22. So it's three different pistols, um, three different distances and three different targets, but um, they're all a little bit different. So, you know, you have to train each one of them. So when you travel to an event, it's like, what, you certainly aren't bringing these things on board. What the heck are you doing with your pistols? Well, you do check them. Um, yeah. You, you know, it, like at first I was really scared when I first started yeah. traveling. Um, but you just make sure that the, uh, you know, attendant at the airline desk knows that you're, that you have pistols and you have to sign a little card to say that they're unloaded and locked and then once you check them, you have to take them to TSA and they check them over and um, then they ship them off to your destination. But every country is different. Um, and to get into a country, a different country with your gun, you have to have um, papers and permits. And so that's something that the coach really works on. You know, you have to give your serial numbers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But you know, the coach gets all the permits in place to make sure that we're ready to be where we are. And, um, you know, I've had different experiences in different places. Like we went to Dubai and we had to pay to get our guns out of the country as opposed to into the country, um, you know, and there have been times when I'm like, you know, oh, did I let the air out of my, you know, air cylinder on my air pistol or um, you know, is my gun locked? You know, I mean, there's always, I think it's a little bit stressful. Um, but we've, we've, we've gotten where we were going every time. So it's, it's been good. When you look at your life and look at what you've accomplished since 2000, uh, how do you look back on it? Um, you know, I think it's been the best part of my life, really. I, I, you know, I had so many opportunities open up to me. I took advantage of those opportunities. I've taken advantage of you know, having a second chance at life, you know, I could very easily have been killed in the bike accident. And, yeah. um, you know, like it's, it, it kind of took me up a level in terms of what I was motivated to do and, you know, how hard I was willing to work and, and all of that. So, you know, I think that my accident has really contributed to making me the person I am. And, um, and I, and I like that. I think that's great. Is there, was there a low point after you were injured? Was there a point where you're like, what am I, what the heck am I going to do? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely low points and it wasn't like just one section of time. For me, it was really a, a roller coaster. So, you know, some days I would think, oh, this isn't so bad, I can handle it. Then there were other days that would be like, oh, this is the worst thing, you know, in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it was just being able, just knowing that, you know, if there was a down day, just knowing that, you know, the next day or the day after that, I was going to be back up and, you know, ready to go and make it, make it work. So um, it's, you know, it's, I think a lot of it is your personality. A lot of it is the people who surround you, um, you know, the things that you choose to get involved in to, you know, help that rehab. And I think that sport is, you know, one of those things, because it always gave me something to look forward to. And especially with that um, triathlon team, you know, I would get calls from CAF or from John Beeson. And all of a sudden, it's like, you want to go to New York? You want to go to California? You want to go like, you know, so I just, I just plan to be fit and in shape at all times of the year, because I never knew when I was going to get that phone call that said, Oh, hey, we've got money and opportunity to go to this race. And you know, one time it was like, do you want to go to Honolulu? And I was like, yeah, my bags are packed. Let's go. So, I mean, that, that was really fun. Just like always, you know, on standby and ready to race. Well, and you knew that you guys were planting the seeds. You knew Absolutely. that this is, this is going to get big. I remember when John Beeson told me he flew to Colorado Springs and met with the powers that be and said, how do I get paratriathlon into the Paralympics? And they were like, that will never happen. It will never happen. And John was like, I don't think oh, you yeah, know well. me very well. I, I, I think right? it will happen. You haven't met, you Trisha, you haven't met Sarah, you haven't met a lot of our athletes. It's, it's going to get there. Yeah. When for, for you, you've had a lot of CAF moments. Is there one CAF moment that resonates with you? Um, yeah, when Robin Williams kissed me on the cheek. <laughs> oh. uh, when I was, I, um, 
won the most inspirational athlete one year and um, was fortunate to have Robin Williams introduce me and he came and he sat down and he talked to me and um, you know when I got my award he gave me a kiss on the cheek and I thought oh my gosh this is great you know it was it was so awesome awesome that was a wonderful moment I love that and I'm guessing you over the years you understand that you are a role model you understand that kids who are watching at home parents who are watching at home with their son or daughter in a wheelchair that they look to you to be you know be that uh, beacon of hope it's like if she can do it we can do it how important has that been for you to be that person i think it's really important because sometimes i get you know caught up in the fact that you know now triathlon is in you know the paralympic games yeah. and you know, you know, I, I don't get to take advantage of that because I'm not racing triathlons any longer. My body's just not up for it. And, and so sometimes I can feel sorry for myself. Like, you know, all oh, these athletes are able to really showcase what they're doing on social media. They're, you know, they've got agents, they've got, you know, all these things going for them that, yeah. you know, wasn't a part of the sport back then. But, you know, when I look back, I don't know if there's a better place to be than, you know, one of those athletes that's like really, you know, carving the trail out for other people, because, you know, that's what's important is that, you know, it's hard, it's hard to acquire a disability. And it's, it's even hard to probably have one, you know, growing up and have been born with it. And so I want to make sure that, you know, other people and other athletes know that this is totally, you know, a situation that you can live and thrive in. And, you know, so, you know, there are advantages to being an athlete, you know, now that they were weren't back then, but I, I wouldn't trade some of the just crazy fun times that we had yep. being this hodgepodge of a team where it was like, we never knew what was going to happen next. And, you know, we just adapted and it was, you know, it was fun yep. and it was funny. And I look back at those times that I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what we did. <laughs> I know we're going to New York and they're like, wait, you need to do what for the swim? And how are we going to do this? And it was yeah. everybody. We were all learning, learning at the same time. Exactly. And it was fun. I mean, that's, that's something that, you know, the athletes today won't ever have that experience of being there, you know, ground zero and be like, how do we launch this thing? <laughs> exactly. Well, none of this would have happened without you and without John and with, with so many other uh, legends of CAF who, who really uh, who, who pioneered paratriathlon. Thank you, Trisha, for being such a huge part of the CAF family. It's always so nice to catch up with you. Absolutely, thank you. I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't be where I am now without CAF. And, you know, I think CAF has done, you know, so much for me and, you know, made me be able to get the best out of myself. And I, I love that it does that for people. I think that's so important. Trisha Downing has been our guest on CAF's Heroes of Sport. Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Again, everybody, this is CAF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babbitt. Join us next time. Until then, see ya.